Gotcha games are good despite being gotchas. That is a take I've heard, which means that's inherently, due to their genre, gotcha games are absolute ass. I mean, there's probably a more angelic way to put it, but yeah, they huff shit. Behind all the smoke and mirrors, daily quests, big titty waifus, and godlike music, they be garbage. Just by being a gotcha game, it starts with an inherent disadvantage. It's already starting off to be a bad game. Which means the gotcha game genre is basically viewed as the goblins of game genres. However, some are able to be good games even though they are gotchas. Even though they are being held down by their genre. That is what the take means, and honestly, I agree. I do think that many gotcha games are worse because of the genre. Despite the fact that I play a fair bit of them, okay, maybe more than a fair bit, I might have an addiction. So what tries the line? What makes a game good in spite of being a gotcha, and why are most not at that level to even be considered good games? Well, short answer is, they don't got hot femboys. Long answer is the rest of this video. So let's try to define what makes a gotcha game good, how it can separate itself from the endless sort of bullshit that's dropped weekly. To do this, I'm gonna break down good gotcha games, but I can't exactly go over all of them as, um, there's a lot. Which truly begs the question of how the hell is there that many? Like, bro, straight up, either billions play gotcha games or fucking Jeff Bezos is addicted to them. Cause ain't no way all these games are making enough from just us gambling addicted weebs. But the only ones I'll cover are those I frequent on Anhentai, Ark Knights, Olympus Company, Punishing Grey Raven, Genshin Impact, and Fate Grand Order. I'ma see what the strengths of these games are, to see how they have so far succeeded and how being a gotcha game has either helped that or hurt that. So, Ark Knights, let's apple pie about it. Now what makes Ark Knights good? The story is wonderfully written. I I can't say every event is peak writing as stuff like Ideal City exists, but Lingering Echoes was one of the most emotional stories I've ever read. Near Light took a bunch of different characters and plot threads like the Kagan and tied it together into a great story, even though Lemon Shine was kind of shafted in it. Lone Trail is so widely loved that even a writer for Baldur's Gate 3 praised it. And we need not talk about chapters 6 to 8, everyone knows that shit is undeniably peak. Meanwhile, its characters are really fleshed out. The villains like Frost, Noah Patriot, and even though I completely despise this motherfucker's guts, Anduin, are examples of really well written characters. And when it comes to the operators, there's a shit ton of them, but they have character. I mean, some way more than others. Yeah, bro, it's been years, but 60% of Sutra's character is still fucking ice cream. But my sorrow aside, yes, the characters are well written, and the world building, I mean, fuck, they got an entire world map that literally has an entire history to it. Like geopolitical fucking wars and shit. Bro, they made three videos like a goddamn nature documentary just breaking down how the world is and what it's like. You got Victoria getting raw dogged by the Sarkaz, Bolivar having a three-way war, which let me tell you is a lot less sexy than it sounds. Meanwhile, Ursus is praying for something to unite its falling apart nation, Laterano trying to somehow hold together the shit show that Astera, and then there's Gaul, which, uh, yeah, let me just check some notes. Got gangbanged by Victoria, Ursus, and Lethania and completely fell apart. So yes, for the sake of time, let me just simplify it. The world building in Ark Knights goes crazy. So it's good in story, lore, and characters. What about the gameplay? Well, gameplay will always remain subjective, but I think it's the best tower defense I've played. For the sake of time, let me just simplify why. The synergy in units, map design, and how the events constantly change the gameplay, like needing to use operators to show the map in near light, connecting the music and lingering echoes, or committing hit and runs in Audio City. With every event, the gameplay changes. Sometimes for the worse, like with the most recent one, However, there's also interesting side stuff like the roguelike, four stages mixed into one with a side of tears added on, and the game mode that makes you use operators to consume other operators like Kirby and gain their stats. Don't ask about it. So yes, the gameplay is great at a baseline and keeps getting updated to make it refreshing. All in all, Ark Knights has amazing writing which keeps the world interesting while the gameplay is constantly updating to keep it unique. This is where it excels at. So let's vroom on over to Limbus Company now. The main draw on Bimbus is the writing, and how hot the men are. Straight up top tier is the only term I could really use as a descriptor. Something I've never seen before, which has given me a wide array of emotions. I never thought I could feel that certain way until Limbus Company came in with its amazing cast of men. Let's talk about the story now. So Limbus Company takes very important and very human problems and explores them within its story. Like how Canto 5 is a story about one's meaning in life. Limbus Company is taking its cast of 13 sinners and showing their development, showing how they've changed within the story or how they are going to change. 
And to do that, it goes through very relatable topics, like how Canto 4 is a story about getting over depression. It takes these very personal topics and goes through them with the most extreme settings. Like fighting a gigantic fucking whale that is bigger than Hoyoverse's very obvious favoritism towards Honkai over Genshin. So yes, the setting is great and already has a shit ton of lore for it due to the prior games Project Moon has made. So the plot and world building is legs above many other stories I've read. Gameplay wise, oh, you can debate it heavily. I swear to god there's more breakdowns on Limitless Company's gameplay and why it's either ass or good than there is boring bland video essays that have as much personality as a used condom. That is to say, I've seen a lot of debate on if Limbus' gameplay is trash or if it's amazing. So in my opinion, its gameplay is really fun, but it does tend to either be easy as hell to auto, or in hard battles RNG can fuck you like you're an innocent person in a Shindoella novel. The beginning of battles is very RNG dependent, and later within the battle, more strategy can take hold with RNG having a more minimal, but noticeable hold on bullshit. And endgame content like Refraction Railway, a mode in which you need to get your turn count to be as low as possible, naturally feeds into getting lucky for an optimal score. So I'd say the gameplay has a great foundation and lots of potential, but it's yet to fully realize that, as the endgame content doesn't fully play off the strengths of the gameplay, like Mirror Dungeons having a ton of non-focused battles or Refraction Railway being RNG based. So what Limbus Company does well is story and world building. Players are actively fiending for more story updates, it's easily the main reason people play the game. Whilst the gameplay isn't bad, but it ain't anywhere near equal to the story. However, seeing how modes like Mirror Dungeon and Refraction Railway get updated is something I always look for too. So with that being said, let's bark on over to Punishing Grey Raven now. So Punishing Grey Raven is an action RPG gacha game. The strengths are simple, Vera, the goth mommy, Vera with a ponytail, the midriff warrior, and yes, you've guessed it. This beefcake of a man. So the gameplay is uh, pretty hard to describe in a short amount of time. So uh, just imagine the core gameplay is like you injected cocaine into your bloodstream. And from there take all the characters in the game, give them really interesting abilities to where they all play in noticeably different patterns, sprinkle on some of Hawkeye Impact's gameplay, and then you got Punishing Grey Raven. I go over it more in my review of the game, but long story short, it's fun as hell. The gameplay is incredibly rewarding to master. This shit makes you feel like a chad. It makes you feel like the character you are playing. Which means, yes, if you play it, you can feel like you are a 21-year-old furry. And with that descriptor, I've either made you all hate PGR or love it. There is no in-between. So when it comes to the story, it's similar to Arknights and how it looks to build the world, but it focuses more on building its core cast of characters in the story as opposed to really fleshing out the world at large. You of course still have some detailing the world, but the driving force of the story is the characters and it wants to explore them as much as possible. I mean shit, they got like fucking three or more alter forms of the notable characters in the game. They want you to love these characters and see how they grow and honestly, they succeed in that. Which is why the strengths of it lies in getting new characters to try out a gameplay as they are basically assured to play in their own unique way, different from the last. And when you get a new character, they have changed story-wise. If it's a new alternate form, then you can be assured they acquired some new form of trauma like a fucking gym badge. The main reason to play PGR is to get the new characters and enjoy their gameplay. And from there, you read the new story and come to love the character. That's the easiest way to simplify what makes PGR good. So with that being said, let's horny post on over to Genshin Impact. So Genshin Impact is... Uh, I mean, come on dog, you already know what the hell it is. Open world game, flashy animations, bobblehead characters with faces that look like this, that also has a character whose eyes look devoid of life. Like you're staring into the abyss itself, like you're just staring face to face with the patron deity of death and destruction, the bringer of chaos and... What the hell was I talking about? Oh yeah, it ain't gay if it's for Venti. So Genshin Impact is the most known gacha game by far. And it was able to become that popular because of... Uh, well, it's really hard to pin down why in particular it got popular. The greatest strength is by far the open world. Having all these different and interesting locations to explore is really damn fun. Straight up, I've spent hours just talking with friends as I've gone through the world and explored shit. Now, yeah, I'ma keep it 100. I know for a damn fact that exploration was due to my desire to get rolls. You may call me a slave to the gacha, but those two fucking primos is funding that will go towards making who tau a god, and to me, that shit is worth it. Now, the open world is, for the most part, enjoyable to go through. I say for the most part, as some locations are... <laughs> new methods of torture. And in addition to the open world, you got a big cast of characters to use, with some having amazing writing while still others are kinda just... there. Though I'd say, at a bare minimum, the characters in Genshin Impact are enjoyable. They either got good writing or are just fun characters. There isn't any I hate. 
Except for Chi Chi, but that's cause that asshole stopped me from getting Hu Tao. But I mean, yeah, I did get some use out of her, you know, she makes a really good tank. Now when it comes to the story, I'm kinda 50-50. Most things before Samara are kinda just run-of-the-mill alright stories. Like, Liyue and Mondstadt work as plots, but it's not something I'm really insane about. Whilst Inazuma felt like Hoya was forced to speedrun the story, but Sumero is a damn good plot, and from what I heard, apparently Fontaine is even better than that. Though to me, the lore of Genshin has always been better than the story. Like, on one hand, yes, it's nice seeing Venti with the most shit-eating grin on his face. But on the other hand, I kinda really wanna see the Archon's Fortnite Battle Royale that shit. But to me, Genshin Strength lies in its character's exploration, lore, and story. You get a new region, and immediately you got a shit ton of stuff to explore. New lore being dropped about how a bunch of cool ass shit is happening. 5,000 years in the past, that is. But there's a ton of new characters, who you've seen leaked 10 months prior, that you get to see interact in the story. The story that then builds upon that region and adds to the world building of the game. That is where Genshin's impact excels at. Now, gameplay is its entirely own thing that I'm not covering in this video, lest it becomes an hour long. Yeah, long story short on that front, you know, some people love it, others don't. So Genshin Strength's detailed Let's Owashija on over to Fate Grand Order. Now, when it comes to Fate, yeah, this is difficult. As with all the games prior, I was able to say how it succeeded within a couple of different areas, such as having amazing and different gameplay, but for Fate, dog, I'ma keep it 100, the gameplay is ass. And I don't say this from a place of malice, at this point I'm basically a fucking Fate streamer, right? I say this because, yeah, when it comes to the gameplay, I would not play the game solely for it. It really just boils down to, do you think you can kill this wave with this NP? Then do it, loop it for the next two, and eventually the battle will be over. Sometimes boss fights are genuinely enjoyable, but for the most part it's a very run-of-the-mill turn-based combat system. And hell, it's not really redeemable when it comes to many other aspects. Like, there's not a lot of quality of life. Fuck, there isn't even a goddamn auto in the game. Players deadass had to make a program that can scan what is on your screen and from there properly auto the game for you. And the gotcha system is absolute ass, bro, a deadass takes 300 pulls to guarantee a 5 star unit, and it's a 1% chance for them to get rolled. So all in all, I'ma say it, FGO is ass. It fails in many different areas to the point where it's really hard to recommend people to get into it. Hell, my server tried to warn me of it like the plague because them motherfuckers play it daily. So, with it failing in many different areas, why is it still one of the most successful gotchas? Hell, why is it debatably the most successful gotcha? Well, that's because of one reason, the story. And also the IP is just that strong, but yeah, mainly the story. Fate has an incredibly long-running story that has some of the best writing out there. Straight up, chapters in Fate are basically like a fucking novel, hell, they double the word count of one. Fate has a shit ton of flaws, but it is able to survive because it has one of the best stories out there, which continues to grow with every new update. And then it makes you love all the characters as well. Like, I'm yet to get to Lost Belt 6, but people have told me over and over that when I read it, I will love this smug ass fairy. At this point, them motherfuckers are seeming like a cult. But, yeah, I also kind of understand it. I was playing through Babylonia and actively trying to hate Arish, and fuck was that shit difficult to do. The writing made me take back most of the shit talking I was doing. Which is hard as hell to do, cause I shit talk a lot. So the characters and story make this game stay alive, which is the strength of it. And you may have noticed a theme with me going over the strengths of these games. All of them succeeded due to having something they can build on. The story of all these games is a huge strength, some less than others. As I know for a damn fact, a lot of people play Genshin just so they could see Mami Miku do that little fucking smile in her alt. And for Arknights, I know a lot of people just don't read the story as it's fucking bloated at times. Whilst for FGO, if you ain't reading the story, the fuck else you playing the game for? But with these stories being good, it creates a live service game that has an evolving world which people want to see what will happen next. For Arknights, people are interested to see how Rhodes Island is going to deal with the Sarkovs who are throwing fucking night raves in Victoria. For Limbus, people wish to see how the Sinners will develop and if Virgilius will stop being a fucking fraud. Whilst PGR players are reading the next chapter in the story to just find out which character's turn it is to get tortured in the story. I mean, whenever you hear someone say the units in PGR have a lot of character, just remember the simple phrase, suffering builds character, because that shit is way too true for PGR. And the gameplay is also something the live service mode can build on. Like PGR getting more interesting characters, Ark Knights getting new game modes, Limbus trying to make the Mirror Dungeon Slave Farm actually enjoyable, and they're kinda succeeding. The Fate trying to undo the CBT nature of their combat system with new additions, and it's up to your interpretation to figure out which CBT I'm talking about. And Genshin isn't really looking to change up their gameplay as they don't really make new endgame content. But they keep the gameplay fun by giving players new areas to explore, or making really unique events that stray away from the basic, oh, just kill this group of enemies. Like, it was fun as shit to play Prop Hunt in this game. Deadass, it was one of the better experiences I've had with Prop Hunt. Or taking in some code online to then put into the game so I could play a user-uploaded beatmap. 
Genshin's various events are a way to keep the game feeling fresh. So that's the strength of a gacha game, being in live service and having new story beats, new gameplay modes, or more to explore and fuck around with. All of this makes it so the games give players new shit to do or continue what the players love, like giving more world building or character development. The driving force behind a successful gacha game is its live service nature, being able to give players new content that they love. And of course the thing that trumps all these points and actually keeps the games alive, introducing new waifus. I mean, let's be honest, you and me know this shit. These sides are keeping the servers pumping, let's be real. But on that point, I want to talk about one thing. Would these games survive without being a gacha? If, for all of these games, you instead paid for them and subsequently any updates, would you actually play them? I mean, the answer is definitely per person, but let me just run through my thoughts. So, if Genshin was, let's say, $40 on release, and then every new region costs about $10 to $20, would you actually buy it? This is of course ignoring how it would sell on phones as, you know, let's be real, who the fuck is spending above $20 in the app store so they can play a mobile game? I think if you did that, someone from Google would drive to your house, remember they have your address on file, and then fucking shoot you. As no human would do that shit, spending above $20 to play a mobile game is some skinwalker behavior. They'd shoot you out of concern for the world. So let's just imagine all these games are on console slash PC to where buying them and subsequent DLC is considered normal. So, in the case of Genshin, I can see myself spending $20 for a region. If that region came with all the Archon quests in it and all the characters that would have been released in that region. Like if you bought Sumeru, you'd get Nilu, Wander, the Cabbage Child, and then you'd try your best to delete Dehi off your account. But I can see myself paying for that, it would be worth it. Granted, some shit like Inazuma, I don't fully know if I would. But spending that amount for Sumeru or Fontaine is definitely worth the price in my opinion. But that doesn't really work for let's say Arknights. When it comes to Arknights, I doubt many people would spend $10 on a DLC for one of the events, as in some of them, the amount of gameplay you get is not really worth that price. I mean shit, that means 6 events would cost the same amount as Modern Warfare 3. Okay, never mind, the events are way better, that shit's worth the price. But for Arknights, I can see a subscription-based model working. Paying $3-5 to $5 a month would be reasonable for the amount of gameplay I would get. And again, that is assuming that all gacha shit is thrown out the window and we just get the units via gameplay or something. That would be a fair, reasonable subscription price. And I mean, shit, one gacha game already does that, Limbus Company. Well, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but it's really damn similar. So every new season has a battle pass which you can buy for $11. From there you get a fuck ton of crates that give you shards which you can then use to exchange for units, without having to roll, at all. There is a limited banner system that got introduced recently, but whenever a new limited banner happens, there's like four in a year, you can shard all the prior banners as units for free. You can still get those crates for free, but it's three times quicker to get them if you get the battle pass. Which means that Limbus is pretty close to being a subscription based game. If anything, it would be more accurate to say it's a free game that has a premium where if you spend $11 you can get everything in that season by just playing the game and maybe needing to grind a bit. But no or very little gacha is needed. And if you don't get the pass then you can still get everyone but you'll need to grind more. The hell a lot more, honestly. But that's a topic for a different video. Though that model works really well for the game. It is really close to a gacha game that has gotten rid of the gacha in favor for a more DLC style approach. I think it would be really cool to see more gacha games take this approach to monetization. Make the game free but if you pay X amount for a season then you can reasonably get most shit in it without needing to gamble. I think that would be great. I also think that shit is never fucking happening. Let's keep it real, some banners on their own make more money than a season pass would. The motto is lucrative, why else do you see so many companies making gacha games? It's cause gambling equals money. You take that away, these games do become better, but they make a lot less. Though yes, having gotchas be free to play and making it so if someone spends $10 they get all the characters within a season would be great for the people who play the games. But due to getting paid less for that business model, we can see why motherfuckers ain't ever gonna do it, even though it would make the games better. Except for maybe PGR, cause with PGR you're able to get like 95% of the future characters for free, as long as you play the game it'll give you enough to get them. So that's one where I wouldn't want to pay to then get all the characters as I can already do that shit for free. But if it was made so a pass can give you all of them at SSS with their signature weapon then I can see myself getting that, as it will make the combat more fun. But again, even though it would be great, it's not gonna happen as the current gacha model is way more lucrative. Which then brings me to my final point in the title of the video. Gacha games are good despite being gachas. Let's talk about how being a gacha makes these games worse, how it holds them back. And outright, I was gonna say grind is a big one, as a ton of gacha games basically feel like a fucking coal mining simulator, in which you spend hours getting cards for your operators to then eat. 
apparently. However, I would like to view the flaws present within a gacha game under the idea that all of these games I'm talking about have been turned into a live service without any gacha. So stuff like Grind would still exist as a live service model needs something like that to keep players engaged in playing the game. I mean, fuck, look at Destiny. Yeah, the grind in that is way more than any other gacha game. Though if the games didn't make you grind for roles, then I can imagine some annoying stuff being easier to ignore. For example, if you didn't need to grind for roles in Genshin, then it'd be easier for players who don't like Spyro Abyss to just ignore it. So making it live service with no rolling can make some aspects of the game more bearable, but overall they'd still be grindy games. But a big flaw is having units locked behind gambling. It gives you less gameplay, less gameplay options, sucks for new players, and is hell for collectors. It feels infinitely better to unlock characters via gameplay. Another problem would be power creep. If players didn't have to spend directly for a unit, developers can fuck around a lot more with characters' as kits, instead of having the fear that making a unit ass would hurt the quarterly profit, as making a fun unit would be a great incentive for players to try and get them. But in a gacha game, whenever I ask about a character and the only response I hear is, oh, they're fun, and nothing else, your boy knows they are absolutely cheeks. And because of this, not many people give a damn about the unit or care to roll for them. I mean shit, look at Dehya. A beloved character, great design, great story, people were really hyped for her. Then it was revealed just how ass she was and a ton of people lost interest in her. Because on one hand, she's a beloved character, but on the other, if players aren't going to use her, then not many wish to spend about 180 pulls to guarantee her. So there is monetary incentive behind making a character strong, especially stronger than the last. Another flaw of the genre is the bullshit they use to make players log in daily and constantly play the game. Like daily quest giving roles. I mean stuff like that exists just to keep players addicted to playing the game. This still does exist in non-gacha games, but it's much easier to ignore some materials than it is to ignore something that can make the game more fun. A big thing though is a disconnect between gameplay and story. You can go through a gacha story, have a character become best buds with you, but to actually use them in the game you need to walk to the nearest grindstone and sharpen up that credit card cause bitch you gonna be swiping that. Some gachas have a good connection between gameplay and narrative, like getting Bedivere as a heroic spirit after Camelot and FGO, but others like Arknights can have a whole event where it talks about a unit going to join Rhodes Island and to actually get them, you need to create a catalyst in which you play German music with goat noises over it to hopefully roll that unit. Even though story-wise, they should be available from gameplay. And if we imagine that some of these games are just turned into a full release, pay $60 and get the entire story, no way for updates needed, then even more flaws can be taken away. Like the grind, stamina systems, pacing, FOMO, spending $40 for a costume that should be earnable via gameplay. These flaws usually come with live service games and gotchas are no different. However, above all, the main flaw is simply, as a gotcha, you need to gamble. That is the biggest problem. I've done a fair bit of reviews and I usually get comments by people saying there's no way I would ever play a gotcha game. They are all ass in my opinion. Which is 100% understandable. It makes perfect sense to not want to gamble. Also makes perfect sense to not want to play a game for whatever reason. It's your time. Use it how you want. If you view it as predatory and would like to ignore it, then feel free to. And that's honestly a big thing right there. It's hard to recommend a game where the primary way to get units is by gambling. I can sit here and say how the stories in each of them are amazing or how the gameplay is some of the best I've seen, but the simple fact of needing to gamble to get characters who make it fun is stupid. These games would be better if they weren't a gacha. If some way it was found to fund the game and make it so you only need to actually play the game to get all the characters, then that would be amazing. Gameplay would be varied as all hell, developers wouldn't get told to make overpowered units for the sake of sales, players wouldn't feel the need to log in daily for gameplay incentive, there would be less disconnect between plot and gameplay and the games would be easier to recommend. Being a gacha does actively hurt it. I mean all the popular ones are just great games on their own. That's why I went over their strengths. The gameplay in Arknights is one of the best tower defenses out there. Limbus Company's story doesn't have the most chapters to it yet, but has already hit harder than many other stories I've read. Hell, it has a better story than some visual novels I've played. That's how good it is. PGR ain't no Devil May Cry, but at times, fuck, it gets kinda close. It's like 75% DMZ, which is the greatest compliment you can give an action game. Genshin's world is enjoyable to go through and every new region makes the world feel more alive. Whilst Fate continues to have some of the best writing known to man to help distract away from all the other fucking disasters of it. Yeah, point is, these games have factors that make them amazing. At times better than other games they're competing with, like how PGR is one of the better action games I've ever played. But if they were not that good, they wouldn't survive, or wouldn't be anywhere near as popular as they are. Yeah, I mean fuck, who would want to play a game where you need to gamble in it? Well, unfortunately a fair bit of people would.
But what I'm trying to say is that most popular gotchas have a reason behind their success. They have something that redeems it. Many of them need to be better than their full price competitors. To have a good or successful gacha, you need to make an amazing game. Some aspect has to be godlike. Some games it's an amazing story, others it's great gameplay, and some just need fat titties. Yeah, long story short, the popular gacha games are great at their core but are held down by all the bullshit that comes with their genre. If they weren't gachas then they'd be considerably better games. Imagine Genshin having all regions out on release, and to get the characters you simply had to play their quests or unlock them via the story. To get Ayaka you have to finish Inazuma, to get Hutao you need to go to Wuwang Hill and figure out what shit they be smoking up there that's making them see ghosts. To get Zhao you scientifically devise a way to make people get taller which then makes them praise you like a god. And to get Chi Chi, you don't. What if in Arknights you were able to go through all events when you wanted, so instead of reading Mario Neural and waiting more than a year for the continuation of that story you can just read it immediately afterwards? We also wouldn't have stories that feel pointless, like how Mansfield Break was kinda just there until we learned more about Columbia. I mean, even with knowing more about Columbia, that shit kinda still feels unimportant. And what if in PGR we got the new unit when we progressed to that story? Like getting mom... I mean Vera Garnett when we reached the last spark. It would make the power creep feel more natural as it just leads to the progression of the game. So yes, being a gotcha makes games worse. The popular ones are able to excel as at their core they have something that is much better than many of their competitors. But they would be better games without being a gotcha, despite them already being great games. And that's why I think gotchas are inherently bad games. They start off shit because of the genre, cause deadass, who would play a game where you gamble for gameplay with no redeeming aspects to it? Then they cook somewhere, like PGR's gameplay, Limbus's story, Genshin's world, and come to be good games. That's why I agree that gacha games are good despite being gachas. So that's it for the video, the gacha glazer is finally breaking free of his chains. Nah, I'm just joking, I like talking shit too much to be a glazer. Though make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, if you don't I'll subject you to playing Tower Fantasy for a year.